Well, good morning. Thank you all again for coming out. I think yesterday we had a pretty high level of discussion on the foreign fighter phenomenon, both as in terms of recent trends and also in the cases of Somalia and the Maghreb and Pan-Sahel region. Today, we're going to cover two more cases. The first case here today, Yemen, and then uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, later this morning. And it's my, uh, my honor to introduce my colleague, Tali Helfont. She is a research fellow in the FPRI's program on the Middle East. She has also instructed training on behalf of K3 Enterprises in Civil Information Management to U.S. Military Civil Affairs Unit, human terrain teams assigned to Iraq and Afghanistan. Tally holds a B.A. from George Washington University and an M.A. in Middle Eastern Studies from Tel Aviv University. Uh, so Tally. Thank you, Mike. It's my pleasure to welcome everyone to what promises to be, I think, a very interesting discussion. Um, I'd like to first introduce our paper giver, Chris uh, Bosick. He's a research asso associate at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace's Middle East uh, program. His research focuses on security challenges in the Arabian Gulf and Northern Africa, and more specifically on terrorism, security, and stability issues in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Uh, he's considered a leading authority on rehabilitation and disengagement programs for Islamist militants and extremists. Um, <clears throat> He's written, he's written quite extensively and has given expert uh, testimony before various congressional bodies. Uh, Chris received his MA and his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies at uh, the University of London. Uh, to his right is uh, Brian O'Neill. Brian is a former reporter and editor for the Yemen Observer. Uh, currently, he's a freelance writer based out of Chicago, and he has written about Yemeni security, culture, and U.S. policy towards uh, Yemen and the region for a variety of journals. Um, also, along with uh, Greg Johnson, he ran the, the very well-received Yemen blog, uh, Wak al Wak. Brian currently blogs about Yemen and U.S. foreign policy at Always Judged Guilty. <laughs> so go there. Um, our final panelist is Barak Salmoni. Barack is a visiting defense fellow at the Washington Institute. Um, he, he is an expert in interstate conflicts, regional rivalries, and military capabilities of Muslim societies. And most recently, he served as a political scientist at the Rand Corporation. Um, from 2003 to 2007, he actively trained deploying Marines and soldiers, soldiers excuse me, on various aspects of Iraqi culture and worked in Iraq with American forces on several occasions during that period. Um, Barack was previously on the faculty of the Naval Postgraduate School and has taught, among other places, at Harvard, UPenn, and Swarthmore. He holds an MA in uh, Modern Middle East Studies from Brandeis and a PhD in History and Middle East Studies from Harvard. And Chris, would you like to begin? Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity. Can you all hear me? Yeah. Is this better? Yeah? Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's a great opportunity to be here, and I'd like to thank the, the organizers for the invitation to, to be with you this morning. What I'd like to do is speak um, relatively briefly about Yemen and the issue of foreign fighters and terrorism and security and, and um, some of the issues related with, with all of this. And I think it's probably important to start off um, straight away by trying to put this in some sort of context. Um, and by that, I mean... Uh, and they oftentimes, you know, when we're talking about Yemen, especially in the last um, year or so, the issue has been all about terrorism and security. And terrorism and security is not Yemen's biggest problem. I think that's something that um, Brian has spoken to on, on a number of occasions. It, Yemen is is um, facing a number of challenges, and terrorism and security are just one of these challenges. And thrown into this mix, I think it's important we need to keep in mind that um, it's not terrorism or security issues or al-Qaeda that will be the, the downfall of the Yemeni government or that will lead to a, a failed state or a collapsed state in Yemen. It's issues like the economy, governance, corruption, um, subsidies, um, a whole range of larger <clears throat> systemic issues, including resource depletion, um, 
but primarily focused on the economy. And I think it's, it's just kind of important, I think, that we keep that in mind when we're talking about, about um, conditions in Yemen. And I think this will come up when we're talking about the, the conditions that lead to instability and the, the foreign fighter issue, such as it is. <clears throat> what I'd like to do is talk... Um, about Al Qaeda, and I think one of the, the important things to, to keep in mind when we're talking about this is what we don't know. And I think there's an awful lot that we actually don't know when we're talking about uh, AQAP. Um, the, the question of uh, the role of foreign fighters, I think, is a very difficult issue to, to get at. When you go through the, the Yemeni or the, the Arabic press, I think you can pick up stories about um, foreigners non-Yemeni non Arabs who are killed or captured, um, as well as um, non-Arab uh, non foreigners who are, are killed or captured. Within the last couple of weeks, there have been stories about Saudis and Somalis involved in the, the fighting in uh, 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 Huta just recently. Also, there have been a number of stories about arrests in, in recent days or recent weeks involving uh, Saudis and, and um, South Asians. I think um, in trying to, to put all this kind of together and, and think about this, I think it might be helpful if we thought about the, the people who are active in AQAP as fitting into several different groups. I think there are the Yemenis who are active in, in Al-Qaeda in Yemen who are focused on Yemen issues, who aren't thinking um, uh, much beyond what happens domestically. I'd also throw into that uh, a second group, uh, and that would be the Saudis, who are active in al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula inside, inside Yemen, who I think probably could care less about what goes on inside Yemen, who are thinking about going back to Saudi Arabia and fixing what they got wrong the last time around. Um, I think there's a, a good bit of evidence to, to point to the large numbers of Saudis who have gone into Yemen over the last several years. The list of 85 most wanted that the Saudi Ministry of Interior produced about a year and a half ago. Of those 85 uh, most wanted terrorists, over a third were believed to be in Yemen. And there were kind of regular stories of uh, Saudis being killed inside Yemen. Saudis on that list, including some of the, the uh, 11 Guantanamo returnees who were listed uh, on that list. And then I think you can, you can put into this uh, a third category the third country nationals, the Pakistanis and the Egyptians and, and others. And when I was last in Yemen, I can remember having an interesting conversation with someone who was saying, yeah, I know who's in Al-Qaeda in my village, and it's these five guys, and I'll get rid of them after I get um, a school and a road and whatever else. And I think this raises an interesting point about um, what can be done about the foreigners who are active in Al-Qaeda. And I think that there's, in this conversation, one of the things that kind of came out to me was the idea that you, know, you might be able to get someone to turn out the, the foreigners, the Saudis and the Pakistanis, but not the, the Yemenis. And I think this raises some interesting um, questions for counterterrorism policy and, and, and uh, how we deal with Yemen looking forward. Um, <clears throat> It also strikes me that you know something else we should keep in mind when we're talking about these issues is you know, there's a, a very, very long history of Islamism and terrorism and violence and, and um, um, religious activism in Yemen. I think it's important that we keep these things in perspective on the, the, the spectrum of um, Islamist actors in the country. So I think you know, while the, the portion of the population that we're talking about is relatively very small compared to the overall population in Yemen, <clears throat> That said, you know, stories about 50 foreigners being arrested or 12 Americans being arrested or 36 Americans um, believed to have gone missing in Yemen, um, as a recent congressional report highlighted, I think raises a lot of concerns, especially when we start thinking about the, the recent domestic cases in this country. And almost all of the recent domestic cases include allegations of linkages to, to Yemen, to Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or to... Um, interaction with Anwar al laki the Yemeni-American sheikh who's um, currently believed to be in Yemen. And I think, you know, just if you look at some of these recent cases, if it's, you know, going back to the, the, um, the Fort Dix plot or the other cases like um, the Little Rock recruiting station uh, shooting, Carlos Bledsoe, uh, Nadal Hassan, um, Sharif Mobley, allegedly, uh, Faisal Shahzad, the, the Times Square bomber, as well as you know, most of the, the, in the last several months, there have been a number of uh, indictments, all which carry the, the allegations that, um, of linkages to Yemen, which I think raises a, a, an interesting dilemma. 
for how we're going to think about this looking forward. Um, one of the things that that is is kind of difficult to me, and when I was when I was thinking about this issue, is I don't see in Yemen the same the same. Um, um, instead of developments that we've seen other places. And from that, I kind of came to this, this thought that one of the, the kind of more dangerous things I see going on in Yemen is how, um, how it's being recast as a legitimate place to go engage in jihad. So as before, we're, you know, Yemen would be a place to go train for jihad or rest or prepare um, between campaigns. Something that seems really striking to me is that now it's being um, it's being cast as as a legitimate place to go engage in these activities. And I think when you look at some of the recent propaganda that's that's come out, if it's an English language jihadi magazine like Inspire, if it's a YouTube channel that features all of the the um, AQAP videos uh, subtitled in the English. It's broadening out the appeal, and you no longer need to have access to Arabic. You no longer need to have the access to, to web forums to navigate this stuff. It can be accessed using Google and, and um, YouTube, which is concerning for me as we see how this is uh, broadening, uh, broadening out. I think some of the more recent indictments and, and um, allegations of... of Terrorism that have come up in recent recent months and in the last year or so, I think you see that there's a new type of uh, um, person getting involved in in going to Yemen and getting involved in in this kind of activity. Um, the The last issue that I, I kind of was thinking about in all this was the the role for Guantanamo returnees, and at some point of the 89 or 90 or so detainees, at, at Yemeni detainees still held in Guantanamo, some of them are going to be released one way or another by order of the court or, or otherwise. And what happens when they go back to Yemen? Um, Yemen doesn't have an adequate system in place now for dealing with this, and they won't have an adequate system in place for dealing with other returnees. And we know from previous, um, previous cases that Guantanamo former Guantanamo detainees stay in touch with one another. And if you look at the, the Saudis who fled to Yemen, the Saudi Guantanamo returnees who fled to Yemen, they coordinated their actions not only amongst themselves but with other uh, third country uh, returnees. And they made the decision to go to Yemen collectively. So I think something to keep in mind is not just about the, the 40 or 50 Yemenis who are likely to be released, but also other um, other detainees who get released and what they might do when, when they're released. Um, which kind of comes to the, the, the how do we deal with this, this um, issue. And a couple of things kind of come to mind. The first is, I think, you know, the, 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 how we're approaching security and stability in Yemen strikes me as not something that's going to enhance either security or stability in Yemen. I think how we're, how we're focused on uh, terrorism and counterterrorism issues is not something that's going to lead to the long-term stability in, in the country. And I think we're almost looking at Yemen as if it's a post-conflict situation right now. And I think um, now is an opportunity for us to get ahead of the curve and to deal with some of these issues before they become um, major issues. And I think you can look at Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, or um, Sada, or the South, or any of the other kind of issues going on as symptomatic of, I think, the, the further deterioration of state authority, or the, the idea that, that um, Yemen as a cohesive entity isn't staying um, as it should be. And I think this brings up, there are all kinds of um, policy implications and limitations I think we can talk about in, in the discussions, um, but I think I'll probably stop there so we can get to our other panelists. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the FPI, of course, and Mike for setting this all up and for inviting me. Yesterday was really interesting, and it's uh, exciting to be able to listen to so many people know what they're talking about. And obviously, Chris, thank you for that. Um, uh, so the main question that we're asking here, I guess, you know, is does Yemen have a foreign fighter problem? And as Chris said, you know, it's it's indeterminate, it's probable. Um, you know, the answer is either qualified yes or it's 
you know, um, if it does it now, it will soon. And I think while there's some truth to that, I think it actually, uh, saying that hides a lot of things that are in a uniquely Yemeni context, which is kind of what I want to talk about briefly here. Um, but first, I want to clarify what I kind of see as a misconception that you hear a lot in analysis or in the press, which is that uh, as Al Qaeda was harassed and you know maybe somewhere down the road destroyed in the AFPAC region, uh, that they're shifting to Yemen, and that's the reason why Yemen has uh, has a jihadi problem. Um, and I don't think that's true. I think that's actually kind of a little patronizing. Um, there are foreign fighters in Yemen, of course. Um, you know, the extent of what we're saying non non Saudi actors is still pretty indeterminate. But assuming that their presence is the, uh, is the reason for a viable franchise kind of flips causality around. Uh, they're there because they want to come there, because AQAP is strong and it's a, it's a viable franchise, uh, and the conditions in Yemen seem profitable. But AQAP doesn't exist because of these foreign fighters. Uh, it's an organic, homegrown organization, and it still would be strong if, without foot soldiers from Pakistan or the Philippines coming in. Um, I think this is... In a, in a lot of press and analysis, there's always kind of been a tendency to discount Yemen's ability to produce leadership. Um, even uh, my favorite counterterrorism magazine, The Onion, once called it uh, terrorism's farm team, uh, people not ready for the bigs. And I think that this mentality has been kind of rampant in analysis, and it blows up the importance of foreign fighters in Yemen, uh, particularly the Saudis. Uh, now, the Saudis are obviously extremely important. Um, when the branches merged uh, in early 2009, uh, leadership positions were, of course, assumed by, by people from Saudi Arabia. But really, I think they joined the Yemeni branch. I mean, they had their own reasons, as, as Chris alluded to. They're not so much concerned with, with overthrowing you know, President Salah as much as what they want to do in Saudi Arabia, but they did join the Yemeni branch. I mean, the emir is still Nasser al uh who was Osama bin Laden's secretary before they got separated in Tora Bora. Uh, and in my opinion, the second most important person is also Yemeni, Qasem al-Raymi, who I think is the most dangerous guy. He's, I think he's their chief strategist. Uh, only after that, I think, would I start to list Sauds. Um, and I admit uh, bias towards Yemenis, but it's not like I actually like these guys. So, um, And I think a good example of that, like yesterday, Mike alluded to the attack on Mohammed bin Nayef, the Saudi prince with the most important counterterrorism portfolio in the kingdom. Uh, he was attacked by a bomber who was hiding his bomb in his body, um, and the cell phone went off, and the prince wasn't killed, but that was, that was more bad luck than bad, organiz uh, than bad planning. I mean, it was just he happened to be on the wrong side of the room. And, you know, just because of the nature of the bombing, it was kind of almost seen as a joke a little bit, but what it showed is that in Yemen, even without the presence of foreign fighters, you had the ability to launch and plan an attack from inside the kingdom. Um, and I think that was actually legitimately scary. And obviously, it couldn't be done without the Sauds, but it demonstrated the strength of Yemeni leadership. Um, after that, after what I think was probably the, was their most daring attack, I don't really think the Christmas Day attack should have been a surprise. Um, what they showed is that they're, they're very ruthless, efficient, and uh, pragmatic, flexible planners. Uh, and I think that's really important when talking about the foreign fighter problem in Yemen. Um, so when we ask that, you know, you have to say, what is the problem with the foreign fighters? Um, the fear, of course, the, the overriding fear is that a, a weak and collapsing Yemen state will provide this kind of picture-perfect safe haven for al-Qaeda um, and plenty of dedicated recruits for what is proven to be a very competent leadership. Um, the thinking goes that a failed state will provide uh, this uh, landscape of, of lawlessness and piety, um, and it's always pointlessly mentioned in Osama bin Laden's homeland, but you can ignore that. Uh, there's a little bit of truth to the vision, but I think it's potentially mitigated by a few factors. Uh, the first and most important of which, I think, is that Yemen won't actually be lawless. Uh, it's easy to say that because, you know, we kind of, we, that's our vision of what happens when a government collapses. I mean, I think in our, you know, in our kind of Westphalian mindset, we think when the central government collapses, you have sort of a beyond the Thunderdome situation. Uh, but as Barack and I were talking about before we started, you know, Yemen's actually going to will likely revert back to its older laws, you know, more tribal laws, more in the south, more sultanates. It won't take the exact form, but you have these underlying um, and long-term political conditions that the central government was kind of a graft upon. Um, and I think that, that it would be a pretty easy transition, especially as uh, the president's patronage network collapses. So this is a problem because what Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula has done is they've done a really excellent job of beginning to kind of insinuate themselves into the, into the tribal system through marriage and through recruitment. Uh, so what they're doing is they're creating these safe havens, but safe havens with an element of control to them, which I think is a much more profitable venue for, for jihad than, you know, let's say, the chaos of, of Somalia. Um, 
But I don't think uh, – it's my opinion that I don't think this means that foreign fighters will be able to fit right into that. Uh, it's always easy to portray the U.S. as stumbling ignorantly around, but a lot of people coming in aren't necessarily known. Uh, foreign fighters aren't always known for their subtlety or completely respect for the people around them. Um, people around them tend to be more concerned with food and water than creating a kingdom of heaven on earth, and sometimes this doesn't really uh, this doesn't really fit. Um, and there's a little bit of evidence to that last week, and this is total speculation, so feel free to discard it. But uh, in the Battle of Huta that Chris was mentioning. Um, I saw just a brief little blurb of uh, an Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda was trapped, um, and a tribal leader offered to mediate, um, and they threatened to kill him, which uh, struck me as two things. One is that it seemed a little much, like, no thanks, could have worked. Um, but it also showed, a, I think, a real lack of respect for Yemeni norms. Uh, now, AQAP does flout the rules that usually govern the terrorism game in Yemen, but they've been really meticulous in, in cultivating tribal relationships. Now, I don't, I don't know if this threat was just in the heat of the battle or if it was actually foreign fighters or if it was someone who didn't get the message that, you know, we have to show respect. But I think it's kind of clear that a, a multinational jihadi force will exacerbate the, the problems of this kind of delicate dance of personal relationships that govern so much in Yemen. Um, and this leads to the second mitigating factor against uh, the role of foreign fighters, which is, uh, depending on how you want to look at it, either a fierce, beloved patriotism or ugly xenophobia. Uh, it's, it's up to you. Um, but I, th- I think it's important because of what Yemen isn't. And Yemen is not, uh, it's not a created state. It wasn't drawn up at, uh, you know, by Gertrude Bell's pen. It's not just lot fake lines in the sand. Um, you know, even with all the mind-boggling political differences, there's always been this kind of sense of being in many, this ancient sense. Uh, and this has always made it difficult for, for foreigners coming heavy-handedly in. Um, you know, there's, throughout history, there's a whole lot of people can tell you that going into Yemen is not a really fun thing to do. Um, and I, I definitely don't want to understate the problem of foreign fighters, but um, I kind of want to make it clear that the foreign fighters themselves will also have a lot of problems inside Yemen. Um, right from there, just for a second, I want to talk briefly uh, about, as Chris mentioned, uh, Anwar al Um, You know, he's been called sometimes the world's number one terrorist threat, and uh, to me the answer to that is no, he, he's not. Uh, he's not really a credited theologian, he's not a battlefield strategist, uh, he's a gifted talker, of course, but I think we've really blown up his importance, uh, the government, the media, um, it's, you know, we, we've elevated him and kind of absurdly increased his standing and therefore increased his danger. Um, I could go on about this, but it doesn't really fit the context of the conversation. He's only half foreign and at best half a fighter. Uh, what he can do, though, is recruit people into Yemen whose main skills are, are exploding themselves. And this can be helpful for al-Qaeda. You know, it's always good to have uh, cannon fodder in this war, but I think it also inche- increases the chance of recruits coming in with, uh, you know, with that irritating zeal of new converts, and they'll be getting in the way of the leadership and also continuing to rub locals the wrong way. Um, I just have one more quick thought, and then I'll uh, turn it over to Brock. Um, you know, I didn't want to focus entirely on AQAP. I think um, hopefully we can get into this a little bit in the discussion, but, you know, the porous nature there are, you know, it, it, the porous nature of Yemen's land and sea borders allow for a whole, ki- uh, you know, a whole panoply of shady characters to come in, uh, not necessarily Sunni militants. Um, but what I, what I really want to end with was uh, the note that the real danger is that Yemen can kind of easily be thrown further off balance by people coming in with, with new ideas. Um, I think a good example of that is uh, a man named uh, Mukbil bin Hadi al-Awadi, who's a, he's a Saudi-trained uh, Yemeni. He was, a, he was schooled in Saudi Arabia, so he sort of fits the elastic definition we came up yesterday with of, uh, of what a foreign fighter. And he was one of the main propon- proponents of Salafism in Yemen. And his aggressions and his, his actions, his proselytizing, were one of the factors in uh, the Zaidi revivalist movement. And the Zaidis were um, Shiites who were the, kind of the royalist rump from the Civil War in the 60s. And the, their revival movement is one of the factors that has led to the almost endless Houthi war up in the north. Um, and I think the reason for this, and this is something that we have to really pay attention to in Yemen, is that there's been this incredible compression of history over the last 50 years. I mean, in 1960, North Yemen was under the rule of, uh, still under the rule of the Imam, um, and South Yemen was a British colony. But since then, you've had, uh, you've had revolutions, uprisings, civil war, republicanism, socialism, unity, another civil war, uh, economic collapse, and the rise of jihadis. And I, I think that the real danger of foreign fighters is just throwing another completely uh, volatile element into this almost impossible mix. So with that, uh, Rock? Thank you. And uh, thank you for, for having me here today. It's a real opportunity to sit down.
with the likes of Brian and Chris. And as you were listing off the, the challenges for Yemen at the end, it just reminded me of that Billy Joel song in the late <laughs> 1980s, early 1990s, but the Yemeni version of it. Um, it's also an opportunity to come after my two colleagues because I can make a few comments on what they've said. And uh, I'm so glad that Brian brought up al wadai because he is really an example of, of an elasticity of identity. You know, he, he was born in Saada, in the heartland of, of Zaydi uh, Islam, which is somewhere in between Sunnism and Shiism. Uh, and he was actually a student of Zaydi theology in, in one of the uh, madrasa equivalents in, in Saada. But, but he was put off because he wasn't from the elite uh, religious aristocratic Sayyid or Hashimi class. And it's after that that he goes to Saudi Arabia, just like many Yemenis from Zaydi lands as well as elsewhere went as expatriate laborers. And it's there that he gained his Salafi leanings, in a sense converting to Sunnism. It doesn't mean conversion in the same sense that we have it, but converting to Sunnism, converting to Salafism, returning to the Sada area and becoming one of the greatest thorns in the side of the Zaydi grandees. And, and his preaching, his establishment, I believe, of the Damage Institute, is one of those things that drives the Zaydi revivalism. So elasticity of identity, I think, is, is a very important theme here. And I think something else that's been brought up by the previous comments is that we talk about reforming Yemen structures and the challenges with respect to economics, corruption, and human security, the need to reform Yemen's socio-political structures, which is to suggest, it implies, that there were coherent structures to begin with, which is not that I'm, I'm saying that Yemen is a failed state, but to my understanding, there has not been a unitary Yemen ever governed from Sana'a, where the ruler was able to reign throughout the land. It is not similar in the context, so for example, to the Ottoman Empire, which went through a reformation period in the 19th century to return to its level of central control that it had in the 14th, or excuse me, 16th and 17th centuries. I don't think there was a period in Yemen, either the PDRY, but certainly not the old YAR, the, the northern Yemen, that was like the, the Daoud period in Afghanistan, even. So I, I think we have to bear that in mind in terms of the level of political and security centralization that any government, be it in Aden or in Sana'a, ever enjoyed throughout its land. And, and I think something else that's been brought out today that's, that's worthy of focus is that Southern Arabia, what sometimes I still refer to as Arabia Felix, uh, has, I wrote always, but now I cross it out to be careful and just said frequently. It's, it's frequently been the site of political and armed contestation based upon ideology. At different times, that ideology has been Zaydi non-elites opposition to the heavy-handedness of the elite imamist regime in Yemen prior to 1962. At times, it's been ideological opposition to British colonial presence in the South, and then tinged with the ideology of Marxism. And material deprivation has also been a motive for this contestation. So it, it, it bears mentioning that prior to Sunni Islamist uh, jihadism, or the Houthi Zaydi revivalism turned armed opposition in the north, prior to the movement of Al Qaeda uh, in, in Saudi Arabia into Yemen, it's always been a site of political and armed contestation. And now these are the new vehicles of them. So w with that, I'd, I'd like to make a few comments that, that occurred to me over the past few days and in listening to my colleagues. Foreign fighters uh, in Yemen. Um, one could say, that's my way of distancing myself from, the, <laughs> from these views, one could say that when we think about foreign fighters in Yemen, what we're really thinking about is the presence of U.S. forces, either in Yemen or off the coast of Yemen, we're talking about the presence of U.S. hardware, which the counter-terror and Yemeni army forces have used against the South and against the Houthis. Uh, and this has been one of the major ways that the opposition to the Yemeni government, be it Houthis in the North or Southerners, particularly AQAP, have tarred the Saleh regime, that the Saleh regime has invited in foreign entities and foreign fighters, non-Muslim, to destroy the unity of Yemen and to trample upon Islam. I'm reminded of one of the most popular tracts of the, the Houthi movement, 
uh, which originated as a sermon given by the first leader of the Houthis, Hussein al-Houthi, uh, called the, the Entry or Intrusion of the Americans into Yemen, the Khul al-Amerikan al-Yemen. And this not only was given by him as a sermon or khutbah, but it was recorded, passed around on cassettes, then printed two years after his death, and is still being circulated among those who in various ways affiliate with the Houthi movement. And, and I could add to this list of foreign fighters one that goes much farther back in time. The Yemenis, both southern and northern, have a good memory of, of the Turkish presence or the Ottoman presence, both in the 16th and 19th century, because they beat it off twice. Of course, there was the British colonial presence, and then the Egyptian presence. The Egyptians who came in under Nasser in the, 19, in the 1960s so as to assist a republican regime and undo the, the feudalistic, backward-looking imamists. And it's interesting how, how we talk about um, awareness of local conditions. The <laughs> Egyptians demonstrate a very poor awareness of local conditions and would not like to return to Yemen. I could continue going. One of the ways that the Saleh regime and many sheikhs of tribes in the central and northern highlands are discredited is by the relationship with the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There is a suspicion, and you hear it even among Yemeni government officials, to include the ambassador, that the kingdom of Saudi Arabia would not like there to be a Yemen, would certainly not like there to be a unified or strong Yemen, and thus funds the government this funding government oppression of different Yemenis, and funds sheikhs to fight against the government. So what we can do is create a long litany of foreign fighters if you want to look at it from one perspective. Now, if you're looking at it from the government of Yemen perspective, there are other foreign fighters in Yemen. In fact, there are no real indigenous spurs to opposition to what is a truly republican, constitutional, democratizing regime. Instead, there is Libya, which funds emigres from the south and returnees to the south, and at different times has tried to fund or has funded the northern opposition movement of the Houthis. Uh, of course, there is Iran, the hidden hand which seeks to expand the Shiite crescent, uh, not only into Iraq, but into Yemen through supporting Shiite Twelver jihadists in disguise. The Houthis. So the notion of foreign control, a hidden hand, has been a leitmotif, both of the opposition to the Yemeni regime, as well as on the part of the Yemeni regime itself, which at the very beginning of the Houthi disturbances uh, tried to tar them as being American clients, because the ambassador at the time had visited the Saada area and had made some comments about the need to stabilize. So I think what we need to do is redefine or rethink foreign and non-foreign, taking the emphasis on fighter, off of fighter perhaps. And what I don't mean here is this ummah notion of Muslims whereby all borders are eliminated. What I'm really talking about here is something that's particularly Yemeni, which is the localization of identity, political or otherwise. On one sense, there is a gulf between southern and northern Yemenis, along with an enduring sense of Yemeniness, often opposed to outsiders, there is an enduring north-south gulf. Many southerners accuse the north of occupying the south, and the north does very little to disabuse southerners of that idea. But even beyond that, in the tribal culture of at least central and northern Yemen, and since the unification in 1990, the government has re-tribalized the political culture of the north, of the south, it also extends. The hyper-local identity with group and with territory recasts who's considered from here and who's considered not from here. When there are many political units confined to hills and dales and valleys, that's not how they call them in Yemeni discourse, a foreigner is someone who's from beyond here. We need to also add to this emigrants from Yemen who then return, particularly in the case of the center and south, and earlier in the case of northern Yemeni areas with the expatriate workers who returned after 1990, and the increasing complement of displaced persons, about 120 to 150,000 displa internally displaced people from the conflict in Saada, and growing numbers of displaced people from the intermittent conflict in the south. <coughs> 
when you combine this hyperlocalization of identity to territory and to small groups, the movement of peoples in and out of their areas because they are moving away from violence, when their means of physical survival are being reduced. When you combine with this, the government's use, and I'm not trying to tar the government here, the government has very little resources at hand, so it uses whatever it can. When the government will use regular military or counter-terrorist forces, the demography of which are distinct from the areas in which they're sent to fight. And when the government will use irregular, often tribal auxiliaries, that are specifically not from the areas where they're sent to fight. This was a predominant mode in the north and is starting to be used in the south. When they do this on purpose, not only does it create a precedent for people, as it were, fighting out of region, but it alters the grammar of violence and it reignites notions of who's from here and who's foreign and can work against even the sub-regional unity. I don't know if Yemen's going to break into two or to four and to five, but the combatant movement of peoples has an impact on that. So if we recast foreign and non-foreign, I think it's significant to understanding the challenges Yemen will face. Another aspect here to problematizing foreign is the role of diaspora communities or co-regional or co-confessional communities beyond the borders of Yemen. Uh, we are trying to think of a diaspora community, and you know, there, are, there, are, there are Kurds in Germany, and, and Chris reminded me of, of the, the Yemenis in Germany, particularly Yahya al-Houthi, who has been one of the spokesmen for the Houthi movement, one of the brothers. But beyond that, I think more fundamentally, when you have diaspora communities, when you have communities of southern Yemenis who have moved into the Gulf and elsewhere, and into Europe, and then return to Yemen, they bring with them reified and re-energized identities and notions of cultural relationships and political networks. And in some cases, even in the AQAP phenomenon, they have been returnees, Yemeni returnees from abroad, who have come to find something that they, they didn't expect. They thought Yemen would be a, a, a much more a conducive area to their political and economic interests. And when I talk about economic interests, I also want to emphasize the role of diaspora or co-regional or co-confessional communities in finance of organizations or elements which in Yemen become violent. As we were doing research on the Houthis, the question that continually came up was, where do they get their weapons from? Who abroad is sending their weapons? Well, I think we found out the answer to that pretty quick. There's just so many weapons in Yemen that they don't need to go abroad. And in fact, to the extent that Houthis are, that, that we know from the open source are getting weapons from abroad, it's Egyptian ordnance. It's Saudi weapons and ordnance that come through the hands of Saudi troops who are captured and then disarmed, or come through the arsenals of Yemeni forces, which lose them in the course of combat with the Houthis. But the realm of finance is somewhat different. There are legal networks of commercial exchange that go from the northern highlands down through Sana'a, or from Aden, and then pass internationally into the Gulf Sheikhdoms and even into Iran. Illicit financial exchange then becomes, in some cases, charitable donations on the part of, this case, Shiite minorities or majorities in the Gulf, and then can make its way back into Yemen in terms of funds, which can be used locally, locally to acquire weapons, locally to buy loyalty of tribes uh, in a temporary way, or locally to recompense agriculturalists when you trample their fields or when you requisition their sons or requisition their produce. So I think we have to understand better than we do right now the role of diaspora communities or co-ethnic or co-confessional communities in the larger Gulf in terms of finance. Now, to, to, to look at the, the foreign element in the combatants, if I could take a few more minutes. Um, with respect to the Houthi opposition in the north, um, if you're the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you believe all the Houthis are foreign fighters coming into your land to fight against you, and you're also very concerned that they will energize their co-tribal elements just across the border in Saudi Arabia. Leaving Saudi Arabia aside, though, up to date, we have not been able to detect any substantive Iranian 
presence among the Houthis. Now, it's one thing for the Houthi hardcore or those who affiliate with them to be inspired by the example of Iran in taking down the Shah or inspired by Hezbollah in fighting both internal and external uh, oppression, as they would refer to it. But what we have not found is Iranian state financing. And we have not found what would be the telltale indicators of Iranian provision of weapons, which they can, they can get advanced weapons locally, or Iranian provision of training. The scenario of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force, for example, uh, sending people into Yemen to train. What we would find is a marked increase in the ability for Houthi fighters to organize and, and work in both a foot mobile and mechanized sense against hardened targets. And not only are the regular Yemeni forces so poor to begin with, but we've just not found that increase in capability, which would be a warning or indicator of, Yemen, of, of Iranian uh, government presence. Uh, and there is simply no foreign fighter jihadist incentive to join cause with the Houthis. There's incentive to fight against the Houthis if you want to push your ideology far enough, but no incentive to join with them. Uh, okay. Uh, with respect to AQAP, I think we've, we've spoken about it. Uh, a, a foreign start, perhaps, an emigre start, perhaps, or a foreignized start over time. I think there is a significant ability of those who affiliate with AQAP, who are foreign nationals, to shelter in the central and southern highlands tribal areas. Sheltering is one thing. Controlling and dominating is something different. Uh, so I, I think that instead of, r rather than being an element in the combatants against the Yemeni state, AQAP can provide something like a haven for foreign fighters focused elsewhere. And, and I, th I think I'll just close with a few comments. As my colleagues have suggested, the local context is absolutely essential. And there are so many different hyper-local contexts in Yemen that it, it, it's unfortunate, unfortunately for policymakers that close, rich experience of the local environment and the political dynamics there, which are shifting, which help us understand the role of foreign or local fighters. I think some generalizations can be made. The local context of the central and northern area of tribalism or the re-tribalized political culture of the South, and it was re-tribalized by the regime Sana'a as a hedge against any recidivistic Marxism or against the people who ran the PDRY, these tribalized networks that value providing shelter and hospitality to strangers, particularly to Muslim strangers, and that do value piety, although frequently don't practice ritual piety, it facilitates shelter of foreign fighters, foreign from the next town over, foreign from another country, but not <clears throat> dominance. What has to be borne in mind, however, is that these local conditions are evolving. The, the sociocultural grammar of tribalism or urbanism or social class, be it defined religiously or tribally, is changing because of violent conflict, because of increasing socioeconomic gaps, and because of the use on the part of the government of what one of our colleagues, Sarah Phillips, refers to as neo-patrimonial or neo-tribal approaches, whereby tribalism is resuscitated but altered in a way that reduces the powers of suasion that tribal sheikhs and sub-sheikhs used to have over their flock. Because this is altering over time and being manipulated by the state, at the same time as the ideologization, if I can make that term up, of religion, that is challenging the ability for not only the tribal structures to remain intact, but to insulate them from foreign or diaspora influence. And it, it, it also is working against what I've always appreciated among Yemenis, which is survivalist opportunism, particularly in light of the ideologization of religion. So one could say that the, the conflict at Huta shows more than one thing. Perhaps a threat to a sheikh who is mediating could stick because that very grammar of tribal mediation, which tamps down violence, is being altered and, and lesser valued.
what I'll close with is a is a suggestion that I'd appreciate all of our comments on because it's something that I'm somewhat new to. If the struggle, seemingly the three-part struggle, among AQAP, the government of Yemen, and the United States, if it continues and aggravates and becomes more sustained and more violent, and if it is more focused in the southern areas in particular, in those southern town centers where specific southern tribes have sway and are significant and have significant leaders who are known nationally, it is possible that we can see more of a melding, at least temporarily, of AQAP and southern dissent or southern separatist interests. And I think that will create even greater problems for the government of Yemen and make it even more difficult for the United States to be perceived as countering terrorism and not countering the aspirations of southern Yemenis. Um, with that, I'll close with, I recommend a, a recent video posted to the Armies of Liberation website uh, with uh, Tariq al-Fadli, uh, former jihadist, uh, former protege of, of Saleh uh, and uh, Ali Mohsen al-Ahmar, and now Southern Separatist, raising the American flag over his compound and playing the national anthem of the United States, uh, demonstrating his opposition to the continued existence of the Yemeni regime as such. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Chris, would you like to respond? Thanks. I think I'll um, try to keep this brief so we can get to our discussion. I thought I thought Brian made some very um, some key points, um, especially the idea that um, AQAP is is not the result of a shift to Yemen from Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think it's important to keep in mind that Al Qaeda has this long history and, and this well established um, uh, uh, base in, in in Yemen to draw on, and the idea that. Um, AQAP doesn't exist because of, of foreign fighters, um, but because the movement is, is so strong, the organization is so strong. I thought that was a, a really key point. Um, I also thought his the the point that he hit on about um, foreign fighters having a, having a big problem in Yemen, I think, is, is something else we should keep in mind. And that Yemen's not lawless, and that there aren't parts of Yemen that are lawless. I, I think, or um, ungoverned. I think undergoverned is probably a better yeah. <clears throat> a better way to, to phrase it. But um, it's not. Uh, Thunderdome, like, like, like I think you, you uh, alluded to. Um, I thought Barack hit on a couple of, of really key points. Um, one was, you know, did these conditions ever exist before um, in Yemen? You know, central government authority or, or uh, a state in control of the, the entire territory of Yemen, which you know, I think is, is good to keep in mind. We're talking about Yemen and what it is that, um, especially in Washington, what it is that the United States is trying to accomplish, and it's... it's um, its policies and how it engages with the country. Um, I also really liked the, the the notion that Brock was was getting to about how how the Yemeni government has used um, people from different parts of the country, different regions, and what that does to our, our idea of uh, foreign fighters. I think the use of tribal um, tribal militias and tribal auxiliaries, especially in Saada, I think is, is a, a great example of that, um, which kind of got me thinking about, you know, the whole, this, this is wrapped up in um, notions of identity that I think are much um, beyond what I'm prepared to talk about. Um, and I think on, on your last point about where southern interests and, and <clears throat> excuse me and, and AQAP's interests intersect, um, I'm not. I'm not. I need a lot more time to think about that because I'm kind of um, cautious on, on a, a number of different fronts on that. Um, but I think it would be good to get some the questions and interaction instead okay. of listening to us talk. <laughs> All right. Let me just check with the. Uh, if, if Brian or Brock wants to add um, one last thing. Yeah. I just really briefly. Well. Uh, with, uh, with what Brock was saying, the uh, AQAP and uh, where the Southern movement intersects, um, I'm not as cautious as Chris. That's why, that's why I blog, I suppose. Um, you know, I don't think there's going to be a lot of, uh, obviously not a lot of ideological ties, but uh, what AQAP has always been really good at is figuring out the, the cracks in the system. And as the, the kind of chaos in the South spreads, I think they, they're finding a lot more operational room. And they're very good at being a thorn in the side and kind of constantly, you know, constant irritation on the on the top of Saul's mouth that he can't quite get to. Um, and so I think that they're, they're going to find more space down there. Um, and I think you made a really, really good point where 
if they if there is sort of a convergence in the South, um, what you know, what are is the U.S. interest going to be? I mean, you, if we're helping Salah, uh, you know, crush both of those movements, suddenly we're saying, um, well, we're fighting against militant Islamists, but we're also fighting against uh, you know, the the secular. Uh, you know, almost moderate liberal Muslims who don't, you know, who have are considering themselves fighting against this almost, for, like you're saying, this foreign theological oppression that they felt since 1994. So I think you make a really good point that that might be our most difficult moral uh, and strategic quandary when we're dealing with Yemen, especially if there is this intersection. So. Well, I appreciate that. If I could just make a few comments. I think we have to return to the initial caution that, that Chris made, which is that those things which will do the state of Yemen in or do the the regime in Sana'a in are not necessarily or probably not the, the terrorist challenges. They are the human security challenges. They are the economic and political structural challenges. I think those need to be borne in mind. Uh, and th- with the current regime structure, these are issues on which we have little influence and very little leverage because dealing with them fundamentally challenges the nature of how the regime has survived. Um, and, and something that's not related to the foreign fighter phenomenon directly, but is very significant and on which we have a very shady understanding is the nature or the concentric circles that make up the Salah regime and the coalitions within them and who jockeys for position. Uh, That is something we don't understand well. And to the extent that we don't understand it, we can't understand how different elements who wish to see a different succession, for example, will create relationships with internal as well as foreign elements in seeking power. All right, thank you. Um, We're going to open it up to questions. I'm going to ask everyone to please queue up behind the microphone here. And I think we can start with Leanne. Good morning. Leanne Boudelie, Rand Corporation. I was very interested in Chris's characterization of AQAP as being composed of Saudis, Yemenis, and then third-party nationals. And I'm wondering if the entire panel could comment on any differences among those three groups as far as strategy, objectives, and tactics, particularly as it relates to Chris's point about the shift in the use of Yemeni territory from being a, a rear area or used for rest and recuperation toward a more active theater of combat and what that might do to the larger political and and social dynamics in Yemen. Thank you. After you. <laughs> Thanks, Leanne. Um, I think I think that's a really interesting question. I mean, how how different how different groups would be prepared to engage in different things, right? I think if you look at the the Al Qaeda campaign in Saudi Arabia, right, like from 2003 to 2006, it was always focused only inside Saudi Arabia, right? I mean, they never struck abroad. And Yemen, right, we see it is completely different. And I think there are Saudis who fled to, to Yemen that I think brought with them a lot of kind of institutional knowledge. I, I think some of those things are how do we avoid what we did wrong last time? So I think they're much more careful in how they do targeting, which I'm sure influenced some of the Yemenis who are active. Right? And I think the organization has probably learned from its past mistakes in that sense. Um, I think yeah, this is all kind of like in process in, in how I'm thinking about this. But <clears throat> some of the, the third country nationals who you know, might have been radicalized through this global Islamist insurgency, right, where there are no rules, you can do whatever you want. That kind of seems more in line with targeting civilian airliners and things like that. But if you look at what the the the, the targets inside Yemen, I mean, have always been pretty consistent, right? It's like foreigners and and Westerners and energy infrastructure and embassies and the security services who are going after them, right? And I think. Um, it would be really interesting to know who's actually involved in those operations, right? And I would, I, I have my kind of own assumptions, um, but I would think that the Saudis who are interested in going back to Saudi Arabia, right? I think if we see the things that Saudis have been involved in, it's been 
the attempt on Prince Knife's life last August, the infiltration in October last year, again, allegedly against Prince Knife. Um, and earlier that year, in April, <coughs> the, the importation of large numbers of suicide vests, or the components for suicide vests, which strike me as different campaigns than what is going on inside Yemen. Um, I mean, this is always kind of off the top of my head, but I think, I think you're raising lots of really interesting questions. I'm not sure what other members of the panel think. Well, um, I can't offer too many comments on this, but I think I can offer some of the questions that would have to be asked by the, the foreign members of AQAP, which is, at what point do they calculate that Yemen is a fertile land for jihad, a fertile local land for jihad to emphasize, to, to, to influence the global jihad more fertile than other areas, which means they will focus more on Yemen and not think about returning to their, their home areas. What I, what I do wonder, however, is the effect of the presence of Saudis and third country nationals on the distinction that's offered to me frequently by Yemenis between Saudi Wahhabi Salafism, which is bad and violent, and and Yemeni or Qatari, they seem to list in the same breath, Yemeni or Qatari Salafism, which is much more peaceful, uh, disinclined towards violence, and okay. Um, and if uh, Zindani is a representative of the second one, and he's on a, a specially globally designated terrorist list, I'm not so sure how peaceful or disinclined to violence it is. But I'm wondering how the presence of Saudis and third country nationals will move the ground on which indigenous Yemeni Salafism <coughs> exists and its approach to uh, violent coercion as opposed to persuasion? Um, I think uh, you guys both made really excellent points because I think um, uh, your point about like the Saudi actors you know, want, and you said it in the in the body of your uh, speech too. You know, the Saudi actors wanting to go back into the kingdom, kind of learning from their mistakes. Um, and I, I think when you're when we're talking about uh, the third parties, um, we do have to be careful, as you said, about uh, watching to see how they influence the way that you know the the notions of jihad and religion work in Yemen. And but I think that their motivation, um, and again, this is kind of off the top of my head, like. I think the Christmas bombing uh, showed that AQAP, even though it was technically a failure, it showed that they have this reach and uh, maybe even more importantly, ambition, which was lacking before, you know, when it was a base for rest and recuperation. And now I think they showed that they have this uh, level of competence and aggression that they were willing, you know, you know, barely a year after AQAP officially merged, that they were willing to strike, uh, you know, at an American city. Um, and so I think that... I think it kind of showed that Yemen is the base for, uh, you know, either either the the extremely pious or or the you know young and adventurous. Like this is a this is the place to be now. This will be the this is the center of jihad. And I think um, that's what a lot of the third party motivation, uh, third party foreigners is. I believe. So. Did you want to add something? I was going <clears throat> no, go ahead. If I could just make a comment, I think I was self-absorbed and when when my colleagues were speaking, so perhaps I missed this, and I know I neglected to miss it. But it's one thing to speak about foreign fighters as a factor in Yemen instability. But it's another thing to think about Yemeni foreign, Yemenis as foreign fighters in other areas. You know, I, I don't know if this was covered yesterday, but in the tranche of Sinjar documents, there were Yemenis involved in the fighting in, uh, in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, there's been a presence of them earlier on in Bosnia as well. Of course, we all know about Afghanistan during the 1980s, and, and then they returned home. But then there is the aspect of non-Yemenis who come to Yemen almost as a junior year abroad in their, in their learning ideological development or functional training to fight elsewhere. I think that's one of the major areas of foreign fighter contribution that, that Yemen makes, and we shouldn't neglect that. I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, the one point I was going to add is that um, I think it'd also probably be useful to think about where these these groups of their interests overlap and intersect, and I think if we're thinking about you know, the Saudis and the Yemenis, right, I think well, probably most Yemenis are, or maybe, maybe not, um, preoccupied with what's going on at home and not in Saudi Arabia, 
operations like that against Prince Mohammed obviously are, are directly affecting Yemen, right? So, I mean, because the Saudis are so involved in, in intelligence and counterterrorism cooperation and funding and things like that. Um, but I think also this gets to issues about what's permissible and what's not permissible or what's authorized and what's not authorized. I think that gets into kind of a whole lot of... Um, much more deeper issues about how you were radicalized or what you were exposed to when that was going on. And I think there's so much of that I think that we just don't know about about the conditions in Yemen. Alan, can we take a question from the webcast? Okay, this question um, was partially just addressed by Barack's uh, latest comment, but maybe more discussion is worthwhile. This is from Scott Douglas, Naval War College. The commentators seem united in dismissing the centrality of foreign fighters to fighting inside Yemen. How important then is the dynamic of Yemenis going abroad as foreign fighters and then returning to leadership positions? Or is the AQAP phenomenon dominated by non-emigres and internally generated? Um, I mean, I think it, uh, you know, I think it's obviously extremely important. If you look at uh, the rise of AQAP, I mean, you know, in the Afghan wars in both the 80s and in, in this decade, uh, Yemen provided, in terms of its population, a really disproportionate amount of the people going to, to going to wage jihad. You know, for a number of reasons, anything from tradition to just the economic conditions in Yemen, <clears throat> and just the lack of a chance to. Uh, to really, you know, in some ways to lead a profitable life, which drives a lot of people abroad for adventure. And, um, I mean, if you look at uh, the, the emir of AQAP, uh, Nasr al he went abroad uh, to Afghanistan. He became, uh, Bin Laden saw something in him that a lot of people didn't. You know, he's just kind of a little guy, doesn't look that imposing. Um, and he trained at the feet of Bin Laden, uh, came back through Iran, went to prison, and in prison he met other returnees, uh, other jihadis, and they formulated their plan. So I think, I mean, I think that, that's an extremely important stage of development in Yemen. I'd I, w I would concur. I, if, if you look at one of the well-known leaders of the, the southern opposition, Tariq al-Fadli, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he has a, a similar resume, having gone to Pakistan, I think also fighting in Afghanistan during the 1980s. It, it's, it's worth noting that whereas certain Middle Eastern governments uh, condoned uh, the movement of potential jihadists out of their countries into Afghanistan in the 1980s, Egypt being an example, the, the Yemeni Arab Republic, the YAR, positively encouraged it and facilitated it uh, through its military and security services. His name is mentioned very frequently because I believe he's both a, he's a nephew to the current president and he is the commander of the Central and Northern Front in Yemen, a Brigadier General Ali Mohsen al-Ahmar, not to be confused with the family of Sheikh al-Ahmar, uh, but he, given his, I'd say, violent Salafist leanings, uh, positively facilitated the movement of potential jihadists out of Yemen into Afghanistan and then their movement back into Yemen when they were done there. Also facilitating the movement of uh, Iraqi army officers both after Gulf War I and after the beginning of Operation Iraqi Freedom into Yemen, into the Yemeni army, which is something that hasn't been explored in tremendous detail, but I think is significant when we want to talk about counter-terror cooperation with the Yemeni military. Uh, similar things could be said about the, the, the PSOs, the, the Presidential Security Organization, which was their initial counterterror body, but has since uh, been paired with the National Security Bureau because there are concerns that the PSO has been inadequately inclined to counter Sunni jihadist terror, either channeling it into Afghanistan or channeling it uh, elsewhere globally. So I, I think this is a very strong element, not simply one that occurs extra-governmentally. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, we were kind of talking during the discussion about the way uh, um, how history has uh, affected the present in Yemen. We were talking about this a little bit yesterday. Something needs to be addressed, too. And um, if you look at, uh, like, the returning jihadis from, from, the, uh, from the original war against the Soviets, uh, President Saleh used them against his socialist enemies in the, in the Civil War in 1994. He encouraged the jihadis and... Uh, uh, Ali Musan al Akmar was very instrumental in that, and also um, Sheikh Al Fadli back when he was not um, in the Southern Movement but against them. Um, he's a very principled character. Um, and, you know, that kind of led to, I mean, that led to uh, the Southerners feeling, as you know, you're saying, colonized, uh, virtually colonized by their Northern counterparts, 
um, and it also encouraged, uh, it strengthened and emboldened uh, returning jihadis, the, the Afghan Arabs. Um, so I think a lot of modern Yemeni history, a lot of the conflicts can be directly traced to people coming back from Afghanistan and the way in which the Yemeni government, uh, the decisions and indecisions that they made throughout uh, the 90s led to what we're seeing now. All right, if I could just put a question out there. Um, in uh, some of the other instances with foreign fighters, we've seen uh, foreign fighters imposing stricter religious norms on the local population, and in certain instances, um, sort of violating local norms or, or not playing by the rules, Brian, as you said. And I I'm curious, in Yemen, what is the chance, you know, with so much, uh, with a negative view of the government, with a negative view of the uh, Americans, sort of, when they're drone attacked, what is the chance of the Yemeni population uh, getting fed up with the foreign fighter elements in their countries? Uh, maybe, Barack, you would want to start? I think to, to come at this question from maybe not a d direct attack, but to shed some light on it, um, it has been noted that in some of those areas that had traditionally been less outwardly or in terms of the symbols that Westerners see of Islamic practice, uh, less religious, such as the Tihama or other areas in the south where, where women had been able to go about unveiled and, and clothed in our terms somewhat scantily, there has been change. There has been change. Now, is that as a result of the post-Afghan War I uh, return? Has that been a result of the reinvigoration of Islamism through the Middle East? Or has that been a result of Sana government policies to use a pan-Arab, very Sunni-influenced ideology so as to counter both northern Zaydism and southern Marxism? It's very hard to tell. But there, there are people in these areas who are simply not comfortable doing things the way they used to in the past. I think we need to distinguish between Iraq and Yemen, however, because I think Iraq is the obvious choice here. Uh, AQI started to try to forcibly intermarry and change the, 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 the approaches of, of those in, in Western Iraq, and that and other issues led to their alienation. Um, I, I think we have to distinguish between the two countries in that the, the number of foreign fighters, I guess proportionately, would appear to be much less in Yemen, and the diversity of their national backgrounds, thus the Wahhabi Islamic unifying factor. Uh, would be less in Yemen as opposed to Iraq. Another factor that at least currently is different is the less obvious presence of, of Western security assets in the country, which changed this. Uh, I, I can't speak to the chances of a backlash against the, I'm going to use two terms that shouldn't go together, Wahhabi Puritanism uh, in Yemen. And I think m my colleagues could probably speak better to that. <clears throat> I, mean, I think you raised some, some really interesting uh, points in your question. One of the things that uh, I think in listening to, to Brock talk kind of struck me was that one of the, the things I think is essential to this modern contemporary version of Salafism is this idea of hisbah, right? That it's my, op my obligation to not only do right in my life, but to also do, make sure you don't do wrong, you do right. Um, and I don't know how well that plays in Yemen, actually. And I don't think we've seen, um, to the extent that we've seen it in other cases, things like that. I mean, there's um, Zindani tried to start a, 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 a committee to prevent virtue and promote vice, kind of like in Saudi Arabia, but I don't think that really went very far, actually. Or, yeah, excuse me. <laughs> um, um, that's what happens when I try to use complex words. Um, <laughs> I should have just said religious Excuse police. Use the Arabic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah Matau. Um, but I think it's. I think that didn't kind of very play very well in in Yemen. And um, I also think that there's not as much um, exposure, or not as much. Uh, um, I think you don't see as many, you know, Western restaurants and Western nightclubs and all the other things I think that you would associate with that. I think this is probably, I think, part of the appeal for people going to Yemen in the first place, right, is that it is authentic and it's, it's closer to what it should be, I think, in, in people's um, popular conception. If I can just make a comment. Uh, Chris made a very important point that <laughs> the initiative to increase the, the uh, prevention of vice and encouraging of virtue, which ran into opposition, 
Um, and and this, this initiative was somewhat supported by the regime because Zindani's had a mixed relationship with the regime. Um, that's homegrown. So the opposition to it already exists at home, and, and the factors <coughs> are indigenous to Yemen. And if the foreign elements start to learn anything, they, they will learn from this. Another point he made that's very important is the isolation of, of encouraging vice and preventing, preventing virtue kind of things, the Western kind of things, the spatial isolation of them from the majority of Yemenis who are less privileged. I think the, I think the backlash um, against... Uh, foreign fighters. I think a lot of that will depend on how much control uh, AQAP's leadership would be able to exert over these fighters. Um, well, they're certainly not uh, blood adverse. They aren't, you know, bloodthirsty in the same way that we saw AQI. And you made an excellent point. You have to differentiate that from Iraq. I mean, they don't. It's not carnage for the sake of carnage. They've been very good at, you know, there haven't been these suicide attacks into mosques or into into crowded marketplaces. Uh, they've been extremely uh, smart at preventing. Uh, you know, at preventing uh, the, preventing this backlash, they're not ready to let the uh, turn the Yemenis against them. I think they learned from the Iraqi context, where you know, at some point, you're going to reach a breaking point. People are going to get tired of car, you know, this this random violence. So, but I think if there are a lot of foreign fighters who are coming in and you know, kind of also trying to uh, take part of the Iraqi model, but not in the way of, of restraint, then I think you can have a backlash. So I think it depends how much uh, El Heshi can control the fighters coming in. I mean, if they come in and freelance, then I think you, there's definitely a potential for a backlash. I'd like to ask a question on along these lines, and, and my RAND colleagues haven't worked on this phenomenon, could probably provide some insight as well. Um, it seems that the, the technological sophistication and appeal of AQAP's web-based and audiovisual propaganda has improved tremendously over the past year or so. What would be the role of, of the foreign complement in driving that? Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I think that's, yeah. <laughs> Does anyone want to? Um, I don't know. I kind of... It, it seemed like they started out almost not immediately after the jailbreak, which led to the formation of, of eventually AQAP, but I think you could see it develop kind of or organically mm -hmm. almost. I think there was um, a pretty steady upward curve. <clears throat> so I don't really see how much influence for I mean, you know, I, I certainly don't know for certain, but, um, you know, it seemed like that they really kind of increased in a way that was understandable with their learning. It's not like, you know, suddenly... It's not like the baseball player suddenly hit 60 home runs a year where you see, okay, there had to be a little bit of outside influence there. Um, yeah, I, th I think it was steady enough that there might not have been a huge role, but um, I, I don't really know for certain. I think there's been suggestion recently that um, that AQAP's English language outreach or English language production has been assisted by foreigners or has been driven in part by, by foreigners. I think that's kind of similar to what we've seen um, uh, in Somalia, right? The foreigners who go end up getting involved, many of them get involved in media production and things like that. So I think you know, there's been suggestion of that. I'm not sure how well we really understand that, though. Um, we'll take a question from Katie. Catherine Zimmerman, Critical Threats Project of the American Enterprise Institute. I would like to hear Speak into the, the mic. <laughs> I would like to hear from the panel a little bit more about AQAP's efforts to recruit the English speaking world. Um, you know, this kind of plays right off of the foreign elements within AQAP preparing Inspire, for example. Um, what I've seen, the overriding message of Inspire was not an effort to recruit Westerners or foreign fighters into Yemen to wage jihad but has spread jihad to the West and has given them the basic capabilities to kind of wage a low, low level, low coordination, less sophisticated, um, c continual level of violence in the West. We haven't seen it, but I mean, the materials are there. Thank you. I think, uh, thank you. I think that's a, uh, an excellent question. I think I'm, I'm I'm somewhat conflicted, or I guess I, I haven't exactly made up my mind what I think about Inspire and, and some of these other things. Um, I'm not exactly sure how well centralized or organized, as 
if we think about AQAP and you know, the, the senior leadership, how much they were behind this or how much you know, other actors were behind this, or how much of this was opportunistic. And I think that's probably a word that we can apply to a lot of what AQAP has done. Right? I think probably Christmas Day was in large part opportunistic. I think Inspire was opportunistic. Um, the things that are the most concerning when I look at something like Inspire is how this gives someone the 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 tools and fits with I think kind of the, the framework that's already developing and kind of further adds to that, right? I think um, the the devotion of what probably ten, twelve pages to the cartoon controversy and blasphemy. I think um, I think this is a, a something that you know. Some people took very, very seriously, probably for very good reasons, right? Um, and I think you know, the, the diffusion of this, which I think is something that you're kind of getting at, is something that should be very concerning. And I think that's part of what um, this appeal might be. So I think, it, I think it's going off in different directions, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think Chris really hit the, the nail on the head with, with um, saying that they're opportunistic. Um, I don't think... You know, it, it's been a contention, and I think you know a lot of people uh, agree with that. That Alaki was kind of very much down in the ranks. I mean, he wasn't considered one of the prominent people, and then sort of through the attention that he got with a couple um, successes. Certainly, I don't mean that with any uh, you know moral judgment, but su operational successes. Um, they suddenly realized, oh, you know, we've got something here, and there's you know, and maybe we can expand on this. Um, but I, I think that's more of what uh, we were talking about earlier, kind of almost dovetailing with the, with the southern issue, the way that uh, the conflicts can kind of align, is that AQAP realized, okay, here's something that, you know, we have this tool now. Um, it's not necessarily one of our main goals, but hey, you know, if, you know, if 100 people in, in America get arrested because they suddenly start posting on a, a chat room, but one guy manages to slip through, it's no cost. It's, it's no risk, high reward. So I think that... I don't know how much energy they're going to be directing that way, but it's definitely it's definitely just another tool in their arsenal, a toolbox. Sorry. I'm not sure I understood your question. Let me see if I understood it correctly. Are you suggesting that uh, English language products, which can be globally distributed, are used so as to encourage local jihadist sympathy for, for local jihads in English-speaking areas? So these are the recruitment materials and training materials for globally localized jihads in the English-speaking world. Right. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, can we take another question uh, from the webcast? Yeah, we actually have a few questions here, and maybe I'll try to combine them. Um, uh, Aaron Zellin from Brandeis University asks, is there any evidence that Somalis from al-Shabaab have joined up with AQAP in Yemen or vice versa? And what is the potential of these organizations uh, cooperating or merging? Uh, Gregory Johnson of Princeton asks, um, how or in what way has AQAP regrouped and reorganized in recent months, particularly after losing so many leaders in late 2009 and early 2010? <coughs> what accounts for the move to Shabwa and Abyan from Marib and Al Jaf? And J.M. Berger from Intel Wire asks, can you describe how Abdel Majid Zindani fits in the context of Yemeni politics? How strong is his following? Is he an ally of AQAP? That's a lot. <laughs> um, you want to split them up? Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> I think on the, the first question about the Somalis, I think especially after, uh, after Christmas, there's an awful lot of discussion about um, al-Shabaab being uh, more active in, in Yemen and sending fighters and things like that. There are Somalis who go to Yemen to, to fight and train, and there are Yemenis who go to Somalia to fight and train. There are um, Somalis who make use of the large number of uh, weapons and the, the, the ease to buy weapons and bring them back. There are very well and developed um, 
organized trade, uh, or organized uh, crime linkages and gun smuggling and diesel smuggling, people smuggling um, back and forth. I think in terms of the cooperation, I think this has been much more uh, aspirational than, than fact-based. Um, there have been stories that have been you know, in, in the Yemeni media and others about Somalis who have been involved in fighting, but it doesn't seem this has been as, as uh, organized or as, or as um, large-scale as perhaps um, some people have thought it, it would be, uh, especially last, last uh, winter. I think also it's important to keep in mind, and I wasn't here yesterday, so I'm not sure how much of the Somali discussion got into this, but I think a lot of what is driving things in Somalia is, is driven out of Somali nationalism in, in large part. And I think that's a factor for why you haven't seen more Somalis go fight in Yemen. To bring some of the questions together, I wonder how many Somali students there are at uh, Zindani's Al-Iman University. Uh, I, I think that the less we think about the state of Yemen and the state of Somalia, and the more we think about a northeast Africa-Yemen continuum, which in terms of some of the trafficking movements continues on to Pakistan, um, I think we're in better shape, at least in the northeast Africa uh, Yemen continuum. You know, it's, it's been suggested, if not proven, that uh, the missiles which Israel struck against in Sudan, I believe, had come from Iran and had transited a port in Yemen without the government's knowledge before they made it to the Horn of Africa, mm. suggest this kind of continuum. Uh, the question about the role of Zindani and is he a supporter of, of AQAP, that's really hard to answer. I, I think we can say that he has been supported by the government of Yemen before uh, as, as, a, as one of the concentric pillars, uh, one of the concentric circles of support for the regime. He's, I believe he contributed to the founding of the Islah Party, which has been in opposition to the regime, but geez, has really supported much more than it has opposed it. <laughs> uh, but, but beyond that, some of the things he said and some of those things that may be taught at his university are probably closer to the violent Salafist line than the supposed indigenous peaceful Salafism of Yemen. Um, I think briefly to answer uh, Greg Johnson's question, um, I think what you saw is that AQAP, um, you know, when conditions in Mar became much less profitable, uh, it's what we were saying earlier, they, they were able to take advantage of the chaos in, in the south. Um, and I think uh, a lot of people who don't, you know, when you just hear North and South in Yemen, uh, South Yemen is a, is a political term, and it, um, you know, it, it's not really geographic. I mean, it's geographically accurate, but it's kind of misleading, too, because it also includes the, the vast east of the country, um, which is far larger in space than North Yemen. So I think that there's, there's more operational room in the South right now, and conditions are more advantageous um, just because of everything else that the government is dealing with there. Peter? Okay. Would somebody else like to ask a question at the microphone? Michael Noonan, FPRI, please. <laughs> we talked yesterday about uh, linkages with uh, Al Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, where it's basically kind of auto cataclytic. In other words, it's using hostage taking to fund operations. Is there anything similar like that happening in Yemen, particularly with? either with businesses, with the cot trade, et cetera, where they're kind of uh, using local resources to fund, uh, fund their cause in Yemen, or is a lot of their funding coming externally? Want to start? Go ahead. Chris? Uh, go ahead. Oh. Uh, another good question. Um, you know, I don't. I, <laughs> I guess I'll jump on this one. Um, I don't. I'm not. Really, you know, there's, there's been stories of of bank robberies and stuff, uh, criminal activity, to to fund, which presumably can fund it. I mean, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars goes a decently long way in Yemen. Um, so I don't. But no, in terms of external funding, I'm not really. I don't really have a good answer to that. Um, hopefully, someone else does. In uh, earlier this year, the Saudis arrested you know, 100 and some people. And, and with the, the, all of those arrestees was a, a woman, Haila, who was involved allegedly with fundraising in Saudi Arabia, who was holding um, um, 
sessions at her home to, to raise money for um, women to give jewelry and things like that, allegedly to go build orphanages and things like that in Yemen. Her, she's alleged to have sent some $230,000 or something to AQAP. <clears throat> After her arrest, the Saudis didn't announce her arrest, but when word of her arrest came out, it was after uh, al-Shihri released a statement threatening to kidnap Saudi princes and to execute Christians in, in Saudi Arabia. And this is really interesting in, in large part because the woman th that they want released, Wafa, or excuse me, uh, uh, Haila, was involved not only with fundraising, but also with helping his wife flee Saudi Arabia to get to Yemen. Also was involved, allegedly, with um, um, supporting um, the, the operation in October of last year to... Um, Two guys were killed crossing the border, uh, coming in with, with suicide vests. Allegedly, they're going to go be met up by a Yemeni coming out from Jeddah, and she played some role in all this. Um, so I think there's there is you know money that gets raised in Saudi Arabia. Obviously, there have also been other stories about um, uh, cell phone videos circulating in Saudi Arabia and other places to, to fundraise. Um, but I'm not aware of hostage taking for ransom or other things like that. If I could just address this question by way of two questions of my own for my for my colleagues here. Um, <laughs> if I'm an aspiring Sunni jihadist in Yemen, in the center of southern areas, how much startup cash do I really need to have some sort of effect whatsoever? How much reference am I going to need to have to having a, a development department, as it were, or engaging in fundraising? How much am I going to be able to rely on the largesse of kin network leaders or associates who have some sort of a beef with the regime or feel some sort of affinity with me. Which brings me to my next question, which is, it's one thing to talk of the poverty of Yemen as a state or the poverty of the Yemeni population across the board. But how much is it that Yemen is poor? And how much is it that there is a lot of largesse and wherewithal stocked away in certain pockets, often associated with prominent kin network or tribal leaders who may be able to provide wherewithal inside Yemen? Those are some great questions. <laughs> I don't have answers for you. Barack, you're preparing uh, research topics for a whole host of... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to ask from the microphone. John and tell us uh, for him. Uh, the tourists being captured from time to time by various tribesmen in Yemen, um, does that have any connection at all with terrorist activity, or is it just, as you implied, you know, tribal grievances with the government? And secondly, what about uh, monies coming from Yemenites and elsewhere, uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere, back to Yemen? To what extent is that funding influence or get into the hands of uh, al-Qaeda or others? I'll, I'll speak in terms of the second question uh, on, on the Houthi issue, just because I'm much more familiar with it. Um, as I suggested earlier, um, the presence of, of wealthy Shiites in Gulf countries, either minorities or in Iran, and the presence of Yemeni emigres who went abroad as guest workers may have returned and gone back and forth or may not have returned. Uh, through licit exchange, often the process brings in illicit funds, uh, not necessarily equipment or weapons, into the northern areas and into the Houthi areas. Um, I'm not aware of Yahya al-Houthi, for example, engaging in fundraising in Germany, but that should definitely not be discounted as, as a source of funds uh, for Yemenis. Um, your, your first question about uh, the taking of hostages, you know, we have the, the, there's the Korean situation, I, b I believe, or a, a Belgian one as well. Um, I think a fair amount of that has to do with local tribes or kin networks feeling unincluded in the oil development and oil extraction economy in the area, which are, you know, I think in the case, is actually related to the Koreans in the area. But at the same time, it is also a statement and a front of the penetration, and a front towards or uh, being insulted by the penetration of non-Muslim foreigners in the area combined with excluding the South from the, from the funds that come from it. That, that's how I'd speak to it, but I'm sure. Yeah. No, I think that pretty much nails it. 
I mean, I think you know, kidnapping, you know, the, the typical profile of Yemen has been, you know, foreigners get abducted and spend some time with the sheikh while they negotiate for more goodies from the state, right? Um, the, the, that changed last summer, last spring, um, a year ago, when there's a group of um, aid workers or missionaries, depending on how you what news reports you read, who were abducted, several of whom were executed straight away, and the others are still missing, um, including some children who um, were found by the Saudis when they were fighting in, in the, the last round of fighting uh, in Sada. So I think, you know, the, the, that's, the kidnapping in Sada was much more, profiled much more like Al-Qaeda-style kidnappings in Pakistan and other places, especially as the women were executed kind of straight away. Um, the other, the other question about fundraising, I think you know, Brock, um, Brock hit on pretty well. There's one individual who's been charged here in this country for fundraising and sending material support to AQAP, but otherwise, it's, it hasn't been too many. Mike. Uh, Mike Horowitz, University of Pennsylvania. I, had a, I wanted to go back to the Somali question since I, I, I thought the, the I think it was I think it was you, Brock, the, the comment you made about thinking about Somalia and Yemen as part of the same sort of you know north uh, eastern African oh yes conglomerate is not quite the right word but you know but area. I was wondering about uh, about the pirates and about the relationship between uh, Somali piracy and some of the. Uh, uh, jihadi groups in Yemen, since we know that the pirates have had a, a, a conflictual relationship with some of the groups in Somalia, but there have also been accusations of cooperation. And you wonder whether or not if the, maybe early, maybe it's just me that wonders, if, if some of the jihadi groups in Somalia wiped out the pirates, whether they'd, they'd pull a, a sort of a Taliban with the drug trade and, and, and sort of take it over. So I was wondering about what the, what the relationship might look like between uh, the jihadis in Yemen and the, and the piracy question. Um, I, you know, I'm not really much an expert on, on, on the Somali, uh, the Somali pirates, but uh, and this is just kind of spitballing, I suppose. I think, I mean, there's obviously a lot of conflict, as you pointed out, uh, with the pirates and, and Shabab and, you know, the various other militants in Somalia. I don't know if the pirates would have the same convictions um, with jihadis in Yemen. Um, right now, I don't know of any real linkage, but there's no... I suppose there's no real good reason to think that they couldn't work together in a profitable way. Um, I don't mean to disparage pirates, but I, you know they might. I know it's. Um, but yeah, I think I think that there could definitely be a linkage somewhere in the future. I don't know of one right now. I might be missing it though. So, I, mean, I think the. <clears throat> Um, Somalia is a bit away from what I feel comfortable talking about, but I think if you look at, at <clears throat> most of the piracy, it's further down towards southern Somalia. Yeah, and there is piracy um, close to the, the Yemeni coast, and there are very definitely Yemenis who are involved in piracy, who are involved in identifying ships and spotting ships and things like that. Um, I think th there's not much that I'm aware of about the overlap or the linkages between terrorists and, and pirates. I mean, it seems that most pirates are criminals and involved in a criminal enterprise. I'm not sure how, much, how that translates into Somalia. I think what this, this gets to, I think, builds on Brock's point, but also the one that you just raised again, is that we need to look at Yemen and Somalia as part of a larger complex of instability and smuggling and people trafficking and, and all of these issues. And I think the way that, that the federal government is divided up, our military commands, everything, is so counterintuitive to that. I mean, even regional specialists, we don't go to each other's conferences or read one another's journals. I mean, the people who work on Somalia and the Horn of Africa don't pay attention to the Arabian Peninsula. And those of us that focus on these issues don't pay attention to African issues. But I think we need to change that, because the problems that Yemen is dealing with are much more like those in the Horn of Africa and less like Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Um, and there are very, very strong social and historical ties. So I think this is, I think this, this is moving the conversation exactly where it needs to be, to looking at these two as one, one um, larger subset. And I think that's starting to happen more and more, I think. I will suggest that to the extent that piracy has a negative impact on Yemeni uh, commercial assets or the, ex the export of dwindling oil resources from Yemen. Uh, 
that chips away at the already eroding legitimacy of the Yemeni regime. Uh, and if it's happening off the southern coast, it, it betters the southern claim that we can rule ourselves better from here. And to the extent that Western countries wish to conclusively and continuously confront the piracy challenge, that's going to require uh, increasing cooperation with regional governments, which threatens to even more tar the Sana'a regime as a lackey of, of the U.S. It's harder to portray him as a lackey of, of President Obama. It's so much easier rhetorically to portray him as, as a lackey of the previous administration, regardless of, of your ties, of, of, your, of your approach. But the, the general tenor will continue. Alan, can we take a final question from the webcast? Okay. Lieutenant Colonel Guild from Special Operations Command writes, it seems that the Yemeni government should be very concerned about the potential threat to their regime from foreign fighters and their integration into AQAP. What red line should we look for? What events should oc would occur before the Yemeni government forcefully cracks down on the internal threat? I see the scenario similar in Syria. Um, I think, I kind of think, at least from the government's perspective, that red line has been crossed. I mean, certainly you can look at the history of, of uh, dealing with, with President Saleh and his government, and they, you know, they're play, they have often played what we see as a double game, um, but that's only because we have the unfortunate tendency to assume that if interests don't align 100 percent, there's some kind of manipulation going on. Um, but right now, I think our interests dovetail enough. I think, you know, certainly um, what we call the, the prior incarnation of al-Qaeda in Yemen were much more prone to negotiating with the government to working out a deal, um, which is why, you know, we always thought that Saleh was being a bit duplicitous, and r rightfully so to an extent. But now I think that this generation, their goal, uh, certainly in the short term, is to completely destabilize the Yemeni government. So I think that Salah is ready to crack down. I think this is one of those rare interests where our interest, rare instances where what we want and what he wants are kind of the same thing. Now, how he goes about doing it um, could very definitely hurt our interest in the long run or even in the short run, depending on how vicious he is and how much he conflates his enemies in the north and the south with um, our mutual enemies in Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. The, the oft-quoted uh, comment, I believe, by President Saleh himself about how he rules Yemen, the title of a recent book, is that he is forced to dance on the head of snakes uh, instead of crushing their heads, dances on the heads of snakes with alternating uh, patronage, co-optation, with selected repression, often by the state, that then he can act as the mediator to lessen so as to retain his own position. Um, but in, in the opinion of the person who wrote the book of that name, Victoria Clark, uh, he has less and less largesse all the time to dance on the heads of snakes. Um, and I would add to that less and less capacity to really crush the heads of them at the same time. So if, if the question is from the perspective of what are the warnings and indicators that uh, the presence of foreign, foreign elements which drive or support uh, local opposition in the Yemeni regime, yeah, I, I think it's hard to say what those warnings and indicators would be, but for me it would, it would be uh, a, a lessened desire or ability to dance and, and a recourse to crushing uh, the heads of snakes. But I don't think he has greater capacity than his opponents to do so. I think <clears throat> I think that something that we've kind of been talking about throughout all of this is I think kind of trying to put these these different challenges to Yemen in perspective, and I think this point that Brock was just touching on about the 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 largest pie getting smaller and smaller is something I think we really need to be concerned about. And I think you know, the the continuation of the Yemeni system is is based upon you know, the fact that there's one person who has positioned himself as the only person who can adjudicate all matters in Yemen. And there's nobody who can fill that spot. But also it's based on the continued um, access to a hard currency. And that's getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And I think yeah, as Yemen's economic problems worsen, everything else in Yemen is going to worsen as well. Um, I think this this kind of gets back to a point about I think you know 
AQAP or what's going on in SADA or the South or any of the other um, uh, opposition movements as being symptomatic of the, the state going through this, this process of, of um, contraction, I guess. Um, I think in terms of what are the, the red lines to, to watch out for, um, I'm not quite sure that the interests of the Yemeni government are aligned with the interests of the United States, I think, um, on all these issues. I mean, I think we've made it very clear that our, our interest is counterterrorism, kind of full stop. And we're not focused on any of these other long-term issues. And those are the issues, I think, this is, I think it was Brock was mentioning that um, we don't understand who makes decisions in Yemen and why they do it, or what their interests are. And I think until we understand what their interests are, the issues that we need to get addressed aren't going to be addressed, and that's probably the big conundrum for U.S. policy, I think. All right. I think our time is up, so uh, thank you. Please uh, join me in thanking our panelists.